Hey, everybody. Welcome into episode 164 of the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. My guest on the show today is David K. Richards. Now, let me tell you this about David. He is a visionary leader who helps change makers usher in new paradigms for leading and for learning. He is the founder and CEO of Changemaker Schools, which is a network of micro schools, and also Pathfinder, a program that helps others open schools. Uh, David is also a speaker and leadership coach that leads a mastermind program called The Wise Warrior, and he has a podcast named Changemaker EDU. David and I sat down recently and had a conversation about micro schools. We had a conversation about his journey through education, which I think is truly fascinating. Uh, if you listen to the show regularly, you know that I genuinely enjoy hearing other people's uh, origin stories. And David shares a really wonderful story that has led him into this charter school space and into this micro school space, uh, some really interesting information and i think a fantastic conversation you're going to enjoy this thing you're going to get the whole thing right after this hey leaning into leadership listeners it's darren here and i've got something really exciting to share with you i've been working on something that i know is going to be a game changer for so many of you out there especially if you're an early career principal or a school leader who's just feeling overwhelmed unsure of where to focus your time and just needing a little bit of clarity I've spent years coaching school leaders and speaking at conferences across the country. And one of the biggest challenges I hear all the time is this. How do I prioritize my leadership actions when I get constantly pulled in a hundred different directions? Now, if that sounds like you, I've got some great news. I am launching a brand new digital course designed specifically to help early career school leaders take control of their time, focus on what truly matters and lead with clarity and purpose. In this course, Take Control of Your Leadership, a Road to Awesome Map for Early Career Leaders, will give you the tools and strategies to overcome overwhelm and set you up for long-term success. And here's where it gets really exciting. We are officially in pre-launch mode. You'll have a chance to get early access. I'll be releasing more details over the next few weeks, but here's what you need to know right now. Get over to roadtoawesome.net and sign up for our mailing list. As a subscriber, you'll get exclusive early bird pricing, plus some extra bonuses that I'll be sharing really soon. And you don't want to miss that. In the meantime, keep tuning in to the Leaning Into Leadership podcast, because I'll continue to be sharing more tips, strategies, and course updates in the coming weeks. I can't wait to take this journey with you and to help you lean into your leadership in an even bigger way. Now, thank you for listening. Let's get to today's episode. One of my favorite activities to do anytime I'm speaking is to have people take a step back and think about their origin story. Because so many of us will just make the assumption that everybody came into our chosen field in the same way. But the truth is that by far and away, the vast majority of people who came into education did not decide like in second grade that they knew they wanted to be a teacher. Most have some type of a different journey. Mine, of course, for those who, who haven't heard it, in a quick nutshell, I started as a physical therapy major, changed to business. I've dropped out of college twice, got asked to help coach a fifth grade girls basketball team, and it completely changed the game for me. So... Uh, everybody's got an interesting origin story. And my guest on the show today, David Richards, definitely has one of those interesting origin stories. And I think that's a great place for us to start. So David, welcome into the show. Thanks so much, Darren. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's so funny. Uh, my basketball coaching is kind of part of my funny story coming into education. So I actually started teaching right out of college and as a Spanish teacher, because you didn't need a certification. It was like a part-time Spanish teacher at a K-8 school. And that was the most difficult thing I'd ever done in my life. It was treacherous, no training, walking into a school where the principal wanted me to be there, but none of the teachers wanted me to be there. They're like, we don't think we should have Spanish. So it was just a whole education into education. <laughs> so I left that job after a year and I decided I'm just going to, I'm going to go into banking because I had worked in banks my whole 
college career. And so I could like easily get a job in banking. So I ended up working in banking. I was a corporate banker in Washington, DC. I was 30 years old. Everything looked good on the outside, right? I had the great job. I was working at a great bank. I was on the management track and, but something inside me was just like, I don't love this. And I had always coached basketball and I loved it. I loved every second of it. You know, I, I'll never forget the story. Like I thought I was going to coach basketball to win. And I also have a fifth grade girls coaching story. My first team was a sixth grade girl actually. And the least skilled girl on the whole entire team. I had this, this, I made this decision to have her shoot the technical free throw for whatever reason. She hadn't made a shot the whole entire season. You know how the story ends. She okay. made both of the technical free throws and everybody went crazy. And I was like, that feeling, God, it was just, I needed to have that feeling again of, of having a student yeah. just do so well when no one else expected them to. So that's what got me into teaching. So I quit my job when I was 30. Everyone said I was crazy. How could you leave a corporate banking job and mortgage and two kids and all that to go into education? But I just, I felt like there was something there for me and I had to take that leap. And I went to grad school and, and started teaching. So incredible, man. It's, you know, the more I work with people around the country, uh, heck around, around North America, the more I find that stories like yours are much more common. You know, it's, it's just not this normal, Hey, I'm just gonna, you know, go and I'm going to graduate when I'm 22 and go straight into teaching. Now that said, those of you who that is your path, good for you. Congratulations. I'm so glad you had that clarity, but for many of us, it, it took something to wake us up to help us find that that calling into education and i i really do love your story and i'm glad that uh, we had an opportunity for you to share that um, but there's there's a little bit more to it than that right i mean it isn't just that that ultimately you know basketball is what got you into education certainly something that we we share in common but then that movement forward and into school leadership uh, the charter school world, some of those things. Let's talk a little bit more about that part of your journey. Yeah. So I went straight from Washington, DC, three piece suit to working in an urban school in Oakland, California. And that was insane. Not the kids. The kids were absolutely amazing. It was the administration, the system, the teachers were mean to me. Like it was just, it was absolute insanity. And, but I really had a calling to work with low income students. So I really wanted to stay in that kind of type of community. And my friend from grad school said that he was working at a charter school and that it was actually a 45 minute drive away. It was in the San Francisco Bay area. So, you know, it, it was a commitment to get over there, but he just said, trust me, you're going to come here and you're going to fall in love. So I, I said, well, I'll just apply. He was very convincing because it was quite a drive for me. So it was a bank building and there were three classrooms and it was like, wow, this is exactly what I wanted to do. Like, you know, it was, it was really meaningful and it, it felt different to me than what I was experiencing in my big traditional public high school. And I decided that I would work there and it was a right place, right time story where we went from that bank building to nine schools across the Bay area and 50 million in philanthropy and a model that's now in 300 schools across the country. So it was a crazy journey for nine years. I went from teacher, I taught uh, us and world history for five years. And then I ended up becoming a principal. I went from teacher to principal in a week. And then after two years of three, four, four years of being a principal, one year I was doing both, but after four years of being a principal, then I was training the eight new principals across the whole entire Bay area that were opening brand new schools in, in the same model. So it was crazy. Yeah. And you know, the, I've heard you tell this story a couple of times and yet I still find myself just kind of shaking my head like so 10 schools in 10 years uh, mm -hmm. was was essentially what what you were able to accomplish uh, from 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 being in the corporate banking world to being a, a teacher at a charter school to all of a sudden leading it and then helping to lead the growth uh, talk a little bit about that because you know we're we're certainly at an interesting time in education where so many leaders have have exited the profession and now so many new leaders are are rising in it happens every year but it's happening in much much larger numbers so let, let's maybe start with when you made the transition from the classroom 
into that administrative role and reflecting on that. I know you do a lot of leadership coaching now, so let's maybe pull a little bit of that leadership coach into the conversation. What are some things that you see for those brand new leaders who are just starting out on that journey that are essential and that helped you to find some success? Yeah, it's such a great question. And I think, so our founder, our superintendent, she was really committed to teaching everybody how to be a leader and everybody. So anybody who was employed by the school, regardless of your title, you were going to have a coach. A lot of the time it was your manager, but like you were, there was a focus on your coaching, on you being coached. So by the time I became a principal after teaching for five years, I had done so many things around the building. We didn't have department chairs, it was a pretty small school, so we didn't have department chairs. And But I had led a project, you know, to reimagine the curriculum for the history department. I had led a project on, you know, how we deal with, instead of detention, or we're going to have a community service on Fridays, you know, those kind of things that I wanted to do. So throughout the process, though, she would always say to me, it's not about the content. It is about the content, of course, but it's not about the content. She would always say to me, what we're trying to do here is to teach everybody how to think like a leader and to have the skill set of a leader. So by the time I opened that school, so I spent a year in, a, in the planning stage of, you know, recording, uh, excuse me, recruiting families, recruiting students, getting our building ready, all that crazy stuff for a, a, what we call a year zero in the charter world. And when the school opened, I actually felt really prepared, which doesn't make any sense because we had done an internal training program, but I didn't have a principal certification and I hadn't taken one class from the county office or any university about how to be a principal, but I had the leadership skill set to understand that it was about people, it was about relationships, it was about setting a clear vision, having a clear strategy, managing your time well, all the things that I know we talk about as leadership coaches. And it was really, really hard, don't get me wrong, to be a first year principal, but it was not as hard as I thought it was going to be because I had those foundational skills to lean on. So I think that's huge right there. And and I, I want to stay here for, for just a little bit longer. When we transition, those of us who were classroom teachers and then became administrators, which is most, not all, but most, when we transition, the, the skill set that has somebody be a successful classroom teacher does not always translate well into being that school leader. Now you had a lot of opportunity to help you grow that, but what do you see are, are some of those skills that let, let's say I'm an aspiring leader. Let's say I have been teaching for six years and I think I want to get into administrator uh, into administration. I want to find opportunities to lead in my school. What are some skills I should be growing now that are going to help me when I, when I move into that role? Yeah, this is what I love to talk about because my mentor would always say, whenever I call her with a problem, like, oh, I don't know what to do about, you know, this expulsion hearing, or I don't know what to do about this irate parent or the fire situation or whatever it might've been gun on campus, you know, all as principals, we deal with all that stuff. And she yeah. would always say to me, always go back to what you are great as, as a teacher, what you're great at as a teacher. And I'm like, what do you mean? So she would say to me, what were you great? when you were a teacher, and I was like, well, I was really great at building relationships. I was really great at, you know, inspiring the kids to want to learn. I was really great at building connections with parents. I was really great at conflict resolution. I was really great at, you know, understanding exactly what each kid needed and then scaffolding different places for different kids. And she's like, great. So think about that as you're calling me with these leadership crises, like, okay, so you have an irate parent. Do you have a relationship with that parent? If this was one of your students and the student was yelling at what you do? Oh, well, I would, I would have had, great. Have you built a relationship with that parent? When the, you know how you would get the advice as a teacher, like make the positive phone call home for the kid that you know is going to be a problem on day one, call the parent right away. So you have to call them in a month with a complaint. And so similarly, if you see a parent that's going to be difficult, get, build a relationship with day one, build that relationship, right? So she would always mm -hmm. remind me that the skills we have as teachers are very transferable, that the context and the execution is different, but the skills that, that you have as a teacher is actually it's a leadership handbook. Like you have a leadership handbook that you can use as a teacher in a, in a new role as an administrator. You just have to know how to change the context a little bit. I think that's awesome. I love that. I love that. And so, so as, as people are transitioning, let's, let's, let's kind of push this a little bit forward. 
as people are transitioning and maybe maybe they're in their first year in that role right now, certainly we get we get stuck in the work, right? Um, you know, you've heard me talk about it as just that Superman syndrome, right? Where we think we have to be everything to everybody and we have to run around and put out fire after fire after fire after fire. What are some things that you would suggest? And and as you were growing these, so so you launched, you know, eight new principles, like in a really short period of time, you had to figure out how to create this curriculum essentially for them. What were some steps that you would give to them so that they weren't just running around fighting fires and that type of thing and actually getting focused on the work that truly matters? Yeah, I feel like as teachers, we are very comfortable in the management role. And we're actually working, coming from other, uh, you know, the banking profession and now doing more entrepreneurial work. It's kind of crazy how flexible teachers are. Like we do everything. We make the copies, we do the project management, we call the parents, like, we do everything. I remember when I first got a student teacher and she was amazing. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like she can just make a copy for me or, you know, we can actually have a conversation together. So what I always talk about is that, you know, you already know so many of these things and I help people understand how to, how to translate those into the, into the context of whatever it is that they're doing in the building. And, you know, for example, the best teachers there, we're naturally managers. So what I do is I help you become a leader. You already have it within you. I just help you figure out like, what did you, what was a vision for your classroom? Like, oh, I don't know what you mean. Vision. That seems kind of intimidating. It's like, well, what did you dream about for your kids from like, you know, August to September or August to June? And they're like, oh, I really wanted this or that. And I had, and so I'll just help them kind of pull it out and then I'll just take notes and I'll turn around and say, Hey, this is your vision. You want me to send it to you? And they're like, wait, what? So it's there. We just don't understand how to actually articulate it. So I feel like what I recommend to people that are transitioning is to get clear on what is your vision? What do you really believe? That's my number one question. What do you believe about kids? What do you believe they can do? What do you want them to do? What do you believe about instruction? What do you believe about culture? Like, what do you really, really believe and get really clear on that and then lead from there? Yeah, I think that's 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 just so critical. I mean, you're you're absolutely speaking my language. I mean, it's like you're playing my song right now, uh, which which is totally fine. And I mean, from the time that you and I first connected, we we realized that there were a lot of parallels and a lot of things that that we have in common and a lot of things that we think very similar about. One of those is the importance of culture. And I just I feel like I can't not ask you about culture, development of culture certainly you don't go from from one campus to 10 campuses in that short a period of time without really focusing and, and having success by the way without developing and maintaining a great culture so let's talk about culture a little bit what why you feel it's important and what you think that leaders can do to build the culture they want to see yeah you know i think it starts with the vision. And I remember my first interview with our founding superintendent. And she said to me, I said, well, I originally I was thinking that you know, I was in DC when I applied to grad school. So I said, originally I was going to do education policy. And she was like, okay, well, I have a vision that this school will actually have, you know, will change the face of public education in America. And I was like, <laughs> that's funny. You have three classrooms in a bank. <laughs> you had a vision. And she said that without yeah. laughing. Well, I laughed at her thinking she was joking. No, I, she was dead serious. So she had a vision from the beginning that this was going to be a model that was used across the country. And so she, she stayed with that all along. And she taught all of us that we all have an ability to have a vision. It's not something that we had the growth mindset. You know, you talk about the visionary leader and the, everybody can be a visionary leader. Some of us are more comfortable in that role than others. You know, some of us are more in the weeds and some of us like to be in the big picture, but regardless, everybody has the ability to come up with a vision. So she had a vision for, a very strong culture and she had a vision for every single kid getting into college and she had a vision for you know every individual every parent and teacher being a leader so these values were laid out from the very beginning so when i opened schools and when i replicated schools we would always be talking the same language and, and then from that vision she had intentionality about as we grow the schools i'm going to ensure that there's a bench of leaders ready to open those schools because we didn't hire outside until my ninth year when we hired, we went into Washington, uh, Bill Gates literally made us an offer we couldn't refuse. 
and we went into Washington state from California and we had to hire an outside leader for the first time. And so we had, we had grown with every single leader being an internal hire. Again, that was her vision from the beginning. So that culture piece is so incredibly important. Well, and I think, you know, what, what you're saying there too, the vision, having that long-term vision and essentially setting the standard that whether, whether we have three classrooms or we have 10 buildings or 300 buildings, this is what the standard is. This is what we're going to be about. This is what we're going to value. And this is what we're going to hold really important. So let's, let's kind of bounce that a little bit forward now into your work with Changemaker, uh, Changemaker EDU and the work that's happening there and the opportunity to, to just take all of this learning that you've had and now just take it to a whole nother level. Talk a little bit about that work. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because I was like, oh, this is a really great segue into what I'm doing with Changemaker. And so the podcast is Changemaker EDU, and it was great to have you on. That that episode will be coming out soon. But it the vision with that was that we're in, like you said, we're in this very interesting kind of inflection point in the education space around what are we doing, you know, in the future and what are the new ideas. And so as I reflected on all my years in the charter school space and the success, it always came down to culture and relationships and creating like a big vision that was going to change education. And so I started interviewing people on the podcast about micro schools. I was just so curious. I'm like, tell me about micro schools because I was talking to parents in my community. My kids are sixth and eighth grade. They're next year, sixth and eighth grade. So, and they were telling me like this micro school has changed our lives. I'm like, well, what are you guys doing there? And they're like, oh, everybody knows each other. And the teachers have tons of autonomy and the parents are really involved. And it seems like they really believe in changing education. I'm like, oh, that sounds like 2000, whatever, when I first started with the charter school, three, you know, three classrooms in a bank building. And so what I'm doing with Changemaker, it's now called Changemaker Microschools, is we are creating uh, like a licensing where you can basically license different models, different elements of the micro school model that we're creating. And you can take that and launch it in your community. So just to clarify, micro school is from 10 to 150 kids. If it's over 150, it's not considered a micro school. They're now operating in districts are jumping on. There's a lot of districts that are doing maybe 25 kids, maybe a neurodivergent or some sort of, they're just kind of testing and trying and different, trying different things. Um, they're private schools or nonprofits. So it's becoming this really cool movement that, like I said, I found through the, the podcast, which is great. And my vision is that I'm helping those people that may be listening to your podcast that are like, I don't think I want to do it this way anymore. I don't know if I want to be in the 2000, 4,000 student high school or the, you know, thousand student middle school or 500 student. I want to actually really build deep relationships with kids. I just want to try something different. And so that's where my job is to create a pathway for you to open a micro school in your community and minimize the obstacles as much as possible. And then I get to do what I love, which is coaching aspiring leaders to create amazing schools. So I'm curious, let's let's go a little bit deeper there. Um, you know, the micro schools movement certainly had begun pre pandemic, but as we were making our way through the pandemic and most schools, if not all, were not back in person or were back in a hybrid structure or something like that, more and more and more of those micro schools began to to show up. Is there a common theme that you see, a, a common structure, a common design that allow for successful micro schools versus just kind of your pop up, you know, ooh, let's try this, let's try that. Let's let maybe maybe talk a little bit more about that because I, I think the one thing I, I I have I mean I'm all for having those those smaller environments and having the opportunities for these to exist. But we want to make sure they're done well, which is why you're doing the work you're doing. So, so let's maybe go a little deeper. Yeah, no, it's a great question, and I feel like I think the biggest risk is okay, anybody can open a micro school. What the heck? Like that's crazy. And but I think on the other end of that spectrum, to your question, what do I see across? So there's 125,000 now, and that's the ones we know about, right? Because there's probably a lot of one room schoolhouse or small ones that don't even realize they're a micro school, but. There is now a national microschooling center and they have identified, they've done these really cool reports and gathered a bunch of data and there's 100, 125,000. And what we're seeing is the ones that are most successful, 
the through line is that they're doing some version of project-based learning or self-directed learning. Because what's happening for the most successful ones is they're taking the homeschool curriculum that's very individualized and personalized and then turning it into a smaller school. Whereas in the kind of bigger educational system, because of efficiency and because of the way it was built, we have to have a curriculum that serves, you know, when we were in high schools, 150, 180 kids and elementary schools, you might have 25, 35 kids. So one grade level, it's it's set up for efficiency. And so you're not able to do the kind of individualized, personalized learning and the self-directed learning. So what we're seeing in the most successful micro schools is that the kids are really seen, heard and valued, which I know is an important value to you because it's so small. Like what teacher doesn't want a class size of 12, 15, 18 kids? So you're getting that community with the classroom. You're having parents more involved because they might have been homeschooling last year. And now you're able to do the thing. So my friend opened one. I actually, she hired me to open one in Martin, South Dakota, uh, right outside of the reservation that she grew up in, in rural South Dakota. And she has really inspired me. And she's like, yeah, I'm not using any traditional curriculum. She was a principal and a teacher in the uh, Native American reservations in public schools that I think for like 22 years, but she said, I'm not using any of that curriculum. I'm using curriculum that's been vetted and built for homeschoolers. That is rigorous and really good curriculum because I have eight kids in a classroom and they're multi-ages and they don't, they need different things, but they need it to be more personalized. So it's, it's really been exciting to see. And like, to your point, the pandemic has changed the way that this, there was a market for people to start creating more of this curriculum because we were doing, you know, oh, let's get five of our friends together and do a pod or like, maybe I want to homeschool. And if you think about it, I get phone calls all the time. I want to homeschool my kids because I just can't send them to the big public school. And it's just, you know, teachers are leaving, people are leaving. It's just not, it's not good. And, and it's not even based on the area you're living in. It could be affluent, low income, whatever. It's just like, I can't do it anymore. And they're like, I don't want to stay home with my kid all day. And I don't have the resources. I don't know what to do. So the micro school is actually solving that problem of, okay, we're going to have educators that understand, deeply understand instruction and culture in schools. And they're going to create a micro school that will be kind of the best of both worlds. That's excellent stuff, man. I really appreciate you going a little bit deeper on that uh, because that that exact misnomer that that you addressed that, oh, anybody can open micro school. Um, and while well, there are those who think that, I, I think that was something early on in the charter school movement was, you know, another misnomer that, and, and there were those who tried it and tried to, you know, make them, you know, as a for-profit type of thing. And, you know, certainly, you know, we know what is tried and true, you know, what is actually going to allow for, for successful student outcomes, because that's what this is about, um, or will be those things. And, and I like how you talked about uh, the personalized learning, the, the project-based type of learning, especially when you have you know, multiple grade level, multiple ages of students um, also just gives another opportunity for student voice and for students to demonstrate their learning in a, in a in a different way. Not that those things aren't happening in some public schools. There are some amazing public schools, even very large public schools that do brilliant work with the uh, with project based learning, with uh, personalized learning with uh, some deep work around, you know, connecting career and, and college focus all at the same time. But micro schools certainly give another option to parents and to kids so that they have uh, they have the best choice for ultimately for them as an individual. So um, we're, we're at that point now, David, in the show, man, we could just keep going and going and going. This is a great conversation. Um, but at this point in the show, I'm going to ask you the same question that I ask everybody here on the Leading Into Leadership podcast. You've shared a lot of things already, but let's let's see if maybe there's something more that you can talk about how you're leaning into leadership right now. Yeah, you know, I always answer this question with that. I always lean into my heart. And I feel like the decision to leave the bank at 30 was not a brain-based logical decision. If I had followed my logic, I would not have left that bank to leave, I didn't talk about this, but to leave at 40, to leave the charter school that was so successful and start my own small school would not have been very logical, was not logical, you know? And then similarly to leave my thriving consulting business to go and start these micro schools across the country. None of those have been logical decisions. They've been really heart-based. So if you think about your role as a leader, whether it's a teacher or a principal or wherever you are, assistant principal, just trust yourself. You really know the answer and your heart really knows the answer and you can figure it out logically later. But I always say the way I'm leaning into leadership is really trusting my heart. 
love that answer, man. That's awesome. So uh, people are going to want to get in touch with you. They're going to want to find out a little bit more about you and about the work that you do. What's the best way for people to find David Richards? Yeah, you can go to my website, davidkrichards.com, but I'm a relationship builder, guys, right? So email me, david at davidkrichards.com. I love to take phone calls. I always take phone calls and people are like, do you have time for me? I'm like, sure, let's talk. So I, I mean, after you leave schools, right? You get it, Darren. You would love talking to people. So I always love to take phone calls and I'd, I'd love to chat with people at any time. Outstanding stuff, man. Thank you so much, David, for joining me here on the Leading Into Leadership podcast. Thanks for having me. All right. Once again, thank you so much to David K. Richards for joining me here on the Leaning Into Leadership podcast and for that outstanding conversation. Again, bounce down into the show notes and hit the links there. Make sure you get connected with David. And now it's time for a pep talk. This this week on the pep talk, I just want to talk about being a little bit more of a human leader. Uh, I was reading an article recently about the transition that we're going through in leadership. And in this particular article, they talked about some key characteristics of leaders for now and for going forward. And among the things that they talked about was really focusing on the human side of leadership and leading with empathy, leading with compassion, being able to really lean into relationships with the people that we have around us. And so in the pep talk today, I just simply want to issue you a challenge. I want you to open your phone. I want you to think about your Rolodex. I want you to, does anybody even have a Rolodex anymore? I can't believe I just said Rolodex. Think about the people that you work with. Think about the people that have impacted you in your professional and in your personal life and just pick five. You know, if you want to just open your phone and randomly select five, or if you want to just jot down five, but I want to challenge you this week to reach out to all five of them and just simply share a thought, share a memory, tell them why they're still relevant in your life. Tell them why they're important to you and how they have impacted your life. The more we practice focusing on the human side the better we will be as human leaders. That's what I got for you this week, folks. Make sure you follow through on that challenge. Shoot me a text message. Hit me with a DM. Send me an email at darren at roadtoawesome.net. Let me know what you did. Tell me about taking the steps that you took. Also, make sure you get over to RoadToAwesome.net. If you're not already a subscriber, I mentioned it at the top of the show, but if you jumped over the ad, hey, with that new digital course coming your way, you want to be on our subscriber list. You don't want to miss out on all of the cool stuff that we have coming your way with the new digital course. And honestly, there's even more coming. Man, there's going to be so much exciting stuff to share with you over the next few months. Can't wait to get into all of that stuff. But again, thank you for joining me here on Leaning Into Leadership. Get out there, folks, and have a road to awesome week.